Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get underway, but uh, we've got just a couple of administrative things we'll work through um, before we hit 7.30. Uh, I think the first one is that we, sh those of us that are present here should take out our favourite electronic device and turn it to silent. That would be a helpful thing to do if you wouldn't mind. And in terms of um, operational things, uh, if you have some sort of emergency like a fire alarm, please head out that door to my left, which will be your right. And if you need the bathrooms, head out my right, your left. So let me begin by welcoming everybody here this evening. Uh, on behalf of the New College Lectures trustees, the New College Board and our staff here, we have 182 young people living here in New College during this COVID-affected time, and we have 171 collegians living over at New College Postgraduate Village. Uh, we have approximately 7,000 alumni. So may I begin by wa warmly welcoming everyone who is here with us this evening. We live in strange times. This will be the first time that our lecturer has presented via teleconference. It was not, this was neither his wish nor ours, um, but perhaps it reflects reinvigorated the state's rights in our country to control their borders. Um, last year, we had the Catholic and Anglican Archbishops presenting the New College Lectures in what was the 50th year here at New College and the 10th anniversary of New College Postgraduate Village. At that time, I encouraged people to pause for a moment and consider the ways in which issues of religion are presently interacting with Australian social policy and the law. In this year, this COVID year, our minds have been turned to the health and safety of those we love in a very, very focused way. And within our colleges here specifically, there are several young people who have lost close, close relatives in their, in their families. But this evening, we pause again during this difficult year to go and return to a focus on these important social and legal issues. And we're going to do that courtesy of our distinguished lecturer this evening. So those of us who are physically here, present at New College, and others who'll be joining us via the Facebook live stream, and there'll also be others who will hear a summary of this material presented on ABC Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge at the outset with thanks the very constructive conversations that I had with Mr Andrew West earlier in the year. As we pause and consider the future of Australian society, it is also important that we pause and acknowledge the long history of the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land. So on behalf of us all, we would like to pay our respects to their elders both past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present with us here today. At this point, I'd like to acknowledge my fellow New College Lecture Trustees the Right Reverend Dr Michael Stead, Bishop of South Sydney, and Professor David Cohen, President of the UNSW Academic Board. I'd like to acknowledge the distinguished guests who brave, brave, braved the COVID hazards to be physically present with us here this evening. Um, representatives of present and former New College Boards, Mrs Janet Simpson, the New College Board Chair, Emeritus um, Christine, uh, Professor Christine Alexander, formerly also a lectures trustee, Mrs Elizabeth and Mr Tim George, and Ms Jane Pangakillam. We have a number of distinguished academic visitors, Emeritus Professor David Black and Mrs Ander Black, Dr Russell Clark AM, Professor Gerald Fogarty, master of our arch rivals next door, Rain College, Dr ja Henry Cha from Macquarie University, Emeritus Professor Michael Lawrence and Mrs. Sarah Lawrence, Professor Paul Oslington from Alpha Crucis College, Professor Michelle Riandino from Australian Catholic University, and Dr. Leonardo Velis from Excelsior College. We have a number of other distinguished guests, Mrs. Susan Maple Brown, AM, 
the Reverend Rodney and Leonie Cocking from Wild Street Church, the Reverend Joshua Ling from Epping Presbyterian, and the Reverend Andrew Smith from St Jude's Randwick, and Reverend Dan Anderson from our friends at Trinity Chapel at Macquarie University and Robert Menzies College. Apologies were received from the Premier, Mrs Gladys Berejiklian, and the Archbishop Philip Aspinall, who probably suffered the same fate as our lecturer, and Emeritus Professor Rosalind Coucher AM, the President of the Human Rights Commission, as well as Reverend Dr Ross Clifford and Keith Mitchell of Morling College. Questions? We love questions at the New College Lectures. So, after the lecture, for those who are present here, please feel welcome to write any questions you have on the slip of paper that's been provided. Just put it in the air and an usher will collect it. But if you're here and you like your electronic device or you're watching at home on live stream, please go to the Slido website. Now, for those present here in the room with me, the details are up here on the screen on, your, on my right, your left. And you can just go to that website enter in the hashtag NCL2020 and then enter your question there. For those that are watching via live stream, the instructions were circulated in an email uh, prior to the lectures. At this point, we're about to begin and as is customary at the beginning of the New College Lectures, I am going to pray for us very briefly. Dear Heavenly Father, as we meet here this evening, we thank you for the freedom that we have in this country discuss matters of belief and faith without fear. We ask for your blessing now upon our lecturer this evening that you would grant him clarity of thought and expression. Please grant to us all knowledge of you and a better understanding of you and your ways in this world. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I'd now like to invite Professor Patrick Parkinson AM to address us. Thank you. Thank you Master and Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming to you tonight from the boardroom at the beautiful law school here at the University of Queensland. It was renovated um, about three years ago. It's a wonderful environment for teaching and learning. I really do wish I could be with you in person. Um, but you know, the Queensland government regards Sydney these days as a pretty dangerous place. I can only sympathise with your predicament that you have as many as five cases per day of COVID in a population of 5.23 million people. I really don't know how you sleep at night. But nonetheless, it's too dangerous for me to come and um, were I to do so, I would have to quarantine in a hotel back in Brisbane on my return for two weeks. I can report though that I did get finally a, an answer to my request for an exemption. A very nice lady rang me this afternoon from Queensland Health to give me the answer of the Queensland Government to my request to be allowed to come to Sydney in person? The answer was no. She said, you must be kidding, it's far too, far too dangerous for you. But at least she did phone um, personally and she was very nice about it. So there we are. Um, that's a probably good segue to a comment by way of preliminary. So everything I say in these three lectures um, represent, of course, just personal opinions. I do hold an office at the University of Queensland. I am the Dean of Law. But as with any public statements that I make and that other academics make, when we do so, um, we do so in our personal capacity. And that, of course, includes any comments I might make on the border restrictions. The other thing to say by way of preliminary is that the full text of tonight's lecture will be on the ABC Religion and Ethics website tomorrow. And the other two lectures will appear on that website for the next couple of weeks. I'll be giving you a lot of detail, a lot of um, statistics on some matters tonight. And, You'll be able to find all of that in the written text and there'll be hyperlinks to the sources from which uh, many of these statistics come. So if that's useful to you, uh, it will be available online as well, of course, in summary form in the uh, case journal of the college. Well, I'd imagine that there are those of you who are approaching tonight in a somewhat sceptical frame of mind. What will a Christian lawyer say about marriage and family life in contemporary Australia, I'm going to be treated to an hour of naive nostalgia, a trip down memory lane to a time of happy families and houses surrounded by white picket fences. I'm going to be asked to bemoan the loss of Christian values, to be told that same-sex marriage is the end of civilization as we know it. 
Well, the lectures end with a robust but fruitless call to return to the way things were 50 years ago, when marriage was central to family life and sex outside of marriage was widely understood to be morally wrong, if not infrequent. Well, no. I don't want to return to the past. I want us to review the present with an eye to the future. But to do so, we need to look realistically at what is happening in terms of family life in this country. Let me begin with that topic, though, by saying that there has never been a golden age of marriage in Australia or anywhere else that I know. There has never been a time when all families were either happy or safe. There's never been a time when family life was free of the scourge of domestic violence. There's never been a time when children were free from sexual abuse by their fathers, by their uncles, by their grandfathers. There never was a time, I suspect, when the vast majority of married men were faithful to their wedding vows. There never was a time when most people married for love and stayed in love, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness or in health, till death parted them. There never was a time when men, at least, sometimes did not behave badly. There never was a time when women, at least sometimes, did not behave badly as well. We must never confuse the ideal of marriage with the facts on the ground, the, the warts and all experience of family life across society and down through the generations. I spent 30 years in this field working in family law, working in child protection, dealing with these issues of family violence, of family breakdown, of child sexual abuse. It's grievous, difficult work, but it's part of the reality of families. Christian teaching has long emphasized that we are sinful people in need of a savior. We are capable of great evil as well as great good. If you try to go through life under the illusion that people are basically good, you'll experience endless disappointment and betrayal. So no, there was never a golden age of marriage and we should not romanticize the past. No white people fences here. But if there was no golden age of marriage, there was at least a golden idea of marriage. And that derived from Christian teaching, from the teachings of Jesus. I think there's no better summary of that than in three sentences from the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 10, verses 6 to 8. You'll see them on the screen. Jesus said, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. And in this, we see the critical order of marriage for nation. A man must leave, he must cleave, he must join with his wife, and they must become one. And of course, the wife must do the same. She must leave her father and mother, be united to her husband, become one with him. And in this, there's a profound wisdom. The act of leaving is essential. It's not just a physical leaving, it's an emotional leaving. Men and women need to leave behind their family of origin, need to leave their parents and establish something new. And parents need to give their children up to the new family which has been formed in that marriage ceremony. The tradition of the father giving away the bride is symbolic of this important step of letting go, giving up. The mother too must give up, and I think maybe mothers sometimes find that harder. The mother must give up her son to allow his new wife to establish her own way of running the household and they will differ in material ways from the way she ran the household. From two different families of origin comes one new family, neither a replica of one nor of the other, just as the children to be born from that union will have their own individuality. So a man and a woman must leave. They must unite and they become one entity. The two become one. No longer can they either the husband or the wife think selfishly. No longer is it about his interests, his needs, his desires. It must just be as much be about her interests, her needs, her desires. He must love her as much as he loves himself, and she must love him in the same way. And that call to lose one's individual identity in the collectivity of the marriage is now utterly countercultural. We are so obsessed with our individual rights and needs, but the idea that in some way we should lose our identity in marriage it's hard to comprehend, but note, it is not just the woman who loses her identity in the collectivity of the marriage. It's not just the woman who traditionally loses her family name to adopt his. No, he must give up his individualism too in order to be united with her. Equality is at the very heart 
of Christian teaching about marriage. And finally, there's the third element of becoming one flesh. Typically understood as consummating the marriage through sexual intercourse. In Christian teaching, sex is the crowning joy of an intimate relationship. But it comes last, after the leaving, after the cleaving, after the uniting of two into one in the marriage ceremony. And this is, of course, absurd to many young people in the modern era, maybe to most. Those of us who adhere to the traditional ways are now a relatively small proportion of the population. 81% of all couples who marry have lived together before marriage at least for a time. And the idea that sexual intercourse should be the final step of that union, something that occurs after leaving, after committing to one another in marriage, may seem at best quaint. But at worst, it's a throwback, isn't it, to a dark past where young women who lost their virginity prior to marriage were shamed. Outcasts, whereas men who sowed their wild aids were ad admired. That was a double standard which was intolerable. For all of that, there's great wisdom in it. Saving sex to a marriage marks out the exclusivity of that sexual union. You have an intimate bond with one person that you have had with no one else, and you promise not to have with anyone else, at least until death brings that relationship to an end. That involves a discipline of denial. It involves saying, I'm committing to this one person to the exclusion of all others. Well, that golden idea of marriage was written into the law, supported by a very clear understanding of the nature and purpose of marriage. The definition in common law comes from a famous English case called Hyde and Hyde and Woodman say, decided in 1866 by Sir, uh, by Sir James Wilde. And in that case, he defined marriage as a union for life of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others, as understood in Christendom. As understood in Christendom, he was clearly defining a Christian view of what marriage is. The case was about polygamy. Could polygamy be recognized in English law? It was a Mormon case. Well, he said no. A union for life of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. That was the definition. Christianity, he said, and therefore the law rejected polygamy, but it also rejected divorce by the pronouncement of the talak or the get, or any other means by which men discarded women for whom they no longer had a use. Christian teaching on this is, u is unique to the Christian faith. It's important to understand that that teaching about marriage went against the most primal instincts of men. Lifelong fidelity does not come easily, maybe not to women either, but especially not to men. And it's critical for the well-being of women and children that men commit themselves to the support of their wives and the nurture of their children long after the bloom of youth has faded, long after the first rush of young love has dissipated through the hard times as well as the good times. This matters still. Yes, of course, women are more independent. Yes, of course, many more mothers are in the workforce. But did you know that almost all the increase in mothers' workforce participation over the last 30 years has been in part-time work? So yes, that helps, but it's not any substitute for having the father's income as well, supporting the children. Men provide less investment for their children when they're no longer in a relationship with the mother. That's the evidence all over the world. So the Christian view of marriage as reflected in the common law involved commitment, a denial of your other desires in order to commit to that one person for life, to the exclusion of all others. And that commitment anchors the family. And for women through the centuries, it has created the security and the safety to be able to bring children into the world, to risk that dependence, to make those sacrifices necessary to nurture the children in their earliest years. Christian marriage is profoundly countercultural. Well, of course, what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years is that that idea of marriage written into the law has been comprehensively and completely rejected. And the changes are well known. I'm not going to dwell on, on them. But I want at least to outline them for you and put them into perspective, because we've had a huge controversy in the last few years about same-sex marriage. And for many people, this was a significant departure from Christian teaching, the end of Christian teaching within the law. But actually, the changes 
have been occurring over 50 years, and the biggest change has occurred a decade earlier. And I'll come to that in a second. Well, let me take the first part of that definition, for life to the exclusion of all others. In 1975 in Australia, a little bit earlier in some other Western countries, we introduced no fault to divorce. We said that uh, marriage was no longer a covenant of men and women for life, the exclusion of all others that we would be protected by the law. But for that, to get a divorce, you had to show fault. It was a remedy for a wrong, it was a breach of contract. And what was the remedy for that? Well, spousal maintenance was the remedy for the wife deserted by her husband, who, who was um, husband who committed adultery, whatever it was, or treated her cruelly. It was a remedy for a wrong. Well, at least that was so in theory. The fact is that few men could afford to pay spousal maintenance. And if you go back over 100 years, you find that only about 15% of all divorced men in the United States, for example, paid alimony or spousal maintenance even 100 years ago. Be that as it, as it, as it may, the law at least did um, enforce the covenant, enforced the contract, and treated divorce as a remedy for the breaking of that contract. It also protected the idea of exclusivity through the criminal law. The commission of, of adultery was an offence, a criminal offence, known rather obscurely as criminal conversation. I rather think that when a couple were engaged in criminal conversation, they weren't doing much talking. Be that as it may, that's what uh, the law defines it as. And of course, that's all gone by the wayside now. So no fault divorce, as we understand, 1975 was the first stage of the unravelling of a Christian understanding of marriage in the law. And what it meant after that was that marriage rested purely on internal commitment. You stayed married as long as you wished to. It takes two to marry, but it takes only one person to end it now. You can be divorced, and many people are, without ever wishing that to happen. Well, let's move to the next part of the definition, a legal union, a legal union of a man and a woman for life. Well, that didn't change overnight. It changed gradually. As the law came to recognize more and more de facto relationships in the law for various legal purposes. The first law change occurred in 1984 in New South Wales, which <clears throat> very gingerly, very carefully started to redefine de facto relationships, to give limited legal recognition to de facto partners. And this was without any registration, just by the fact of living together as if they were husband and wife. Marriage, you see, has long been defined as a public commitment, a commitment you make before family and friends. It was not always so. It was not until the 13th century, in fact, that the Pope, it was Innocent III, insisted that for a wedding to be valid, for a marriage to be valid in canon law, the priest had to be a witness. The priest didn't consecrate the marriage as such. The priest was simply a witness to it. In fact, marriages back then had to be conducted outside the door of the church at Austin Ecclesiastes. So if you think about a medieval English village or European village, the church is often in the center of the village. It marks one end of a public square, for example, and the wedding would take place at the door of the church, visible to everybody in the presence of the priest. Why a priest? Because the priest was to be a witness of the fact that the marriage had taken place. It had so many legal effects in canon law, and um, Pope Innocent required other witnesses to be there as well. But it was not until 1563, with the decree Tamezzi of the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church, by then, after the beginnings of the Reformation, insisted that marriage was a sacrament and that marriage was not valid unless consecrated by a priest. Protestant churches developed their own version of that and now it's fairly universal. There'd be some sort of ceremony with family and friends in which the minister, the priest, pronounces you as husband and wife. It was not always so. But what's happened over time is that without any such commitment, without any such covenant, without any such public ceremony of any kind, De facto relationships have been treated as if they were marriages. As I say, it began slowly with limited reform in New South Wales, but what happened over the subsequent 20 years or so is that each state and territory began to reform its laws. And with each development, whether it was in Victoria or South Australia, or Western Australia, 
each state which passed laws on this subject made them look more and more like the Family Law Act, more like um, marriage. And wherever in legislation the word marriage appeared, there would be inserted the words or de facto. Wherever in legislation the word spouse appeared, there would be the words or de facto. Wherever in the legislation referred to a husband, it would say or de facto, a wife or de facto. You see how over time, marriage and cohabitation became exactly the same, had exactly the same legal effects. And that revolution in Australian law was completed by 2008 with um, a, a federal law on the subject in that year. The consequence was that at least by 2008, and in fact, a long time earlier than, than, than that, there was no difference in Australian law between being married and living together in a de facto relationship at least once you've been together for two years. And that included <clears throat> same-sex couples as well. It started off talking about heterosexual de facto relationships, and then gradually um, <clears throat> law was amended again to include same-sex couples as well. So long before 2017, long before same-sex marriage was, was, was passed, same-sex couples, at least once they've been together for at least two years, and of course heterosexual couples living in de facto relationships had exactly the same rights and obligations as a married couple does. The message of the law then was that marriage didn't matter. Well, how does that play out in practice? Let's imagine a couple called Alex and Chris. I've chosen names that are a bit gender neutral. It could be a heterosexual couple, it could be a same sex couple, it doesn't matter. Let's assume they live in Melbourne. You may have heard that there's not much to do in Melbourne at the moment. Kind of locked, locked in. Alex and Chris have watched every program on Netflix that they can find that they want, want, want to watch. And so forced to talk to each other with nothing else to do, they begin to turn to the future of their relationship. Alex says she'd quite like to get married. But Chris is not so sure. Why get married? Why does that piece of paper matter? And so they do what a young couple would do. They go on the internet. They search all the options for formalizing their relationship. They could marry, of, of, of course. They could choose a religious wedding, as long as they can find a minister of religion who's prepared to marry them. There's some nice old churches in Melbourne, medieval stone look, in a very, very charming, very quaint. Or if they want something just secular, and 80% of all marriages in Australia are now with a, a secular private celebrant or through a um, registry office, they could purchase the services of a private celebrant, they could go to a registry office um, and get married there. Well, how do you find a registry office? Go on the reps, website of the Victorian Marriage Registry. There you'll find it promises elegant civil marriage ceremonies for couples seeking an intimate and simple wedding in an old heritage listed building in the city. So those are the options, a religious ceremony, a private marriage celebrant, a registry office, or they could simply register their relationship in five states in Australia, including of course Victoria. You can register your relationship without actually getting married. Now you may wonder, what's the difference? Well, a registered relationship has exactly the same effects as marriage for the purposes of the law of that jurisdiction. So how's it different from getting married in a registry office? It's the same registry office after all. Well, it's very simple. You skip the elegant and simple ceremony. It's so much cheaper. Just think of the savings. But of course, there's no promises of everlasting love for better or for worse, no commitment to a covenant, just a registration, just like you'd register your car. Or Alex and Chris can forget about any form of marriage, any form of registration, and just lived together. The legal effect after two years is exactly the same. My point is this, marriage and law doesn't matter. After two years, the effects are the same. All roads lead to Rome. They all lead to the same outcome. Well, these changes in the law both followed social changes and contributed to them. Law often has that effect. Initially, cohabitation was a fairly short-term thing. People live together for a while before marrying, but now increasingly people live together without marrying and they have children in that relationship as well. If I can just turn to the next slide for a moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, you'll see that 
35% of all children born in Australia these days are born outside of marriage, 35%. And you see from the graph how quickly it has risen since the 1960s and 70s. Australia is not as bad as other countries here. Many countries, more than 50% of all babies born are born outside of marriage. That's so in many countries in Northern Europe. In Iceland, Estonia, it's 60% of all babies born are born outside of marriage. And in Australia, marriage has declined sharply as the basis of family formation. In 2017, Australia had the lowest number of marriages per thousand population ever recorded. It was less than half the number who married in 1970. So this decision to equate marriage and cohabitation to say that de facto relations are the same as marriage has contributed to decline the numbers of people who are bothering to marriage, marry at all. So finally, we come to the controversies of the last few years, same-sex marriage. And I want to be clear that there's no point going back to this debate. It's done and dusted now. It was seen as a great blow to the Christian understanding of marriage, but also the marriage as understood in other great Abrahamic religions as well. Yeah, one point I want to make is this. For the most part, the battle over marriage equality was about equality, not about marriage. For some, the marriage was really important, but then for the most part, I think it was not. You see, going back a couple of decades, there was a big argument in the same-sex attractive community about whether they should pursue the option of legalizing same-sex marriage at all. In the late 1990s, I spent most of my career at the University of Sydney, and in the late 1990s, we hosted a visiting professor from Scotland, a wonderful man um, from the University of Strathclyde, and he gave a staff seminar entitled Marriage is for heterosexuals. May the rest of us be saved from it. Well, over time, that position shifted. As we all know, there was a strong, successful campaign for marriage equality. However, the strong push to allow same-sex marriage did not actually indicate any reversal of the trends away from marriage, which has have occurred for heterosexual couples over the last 20 or 30 years. Promises of a great boom for the wedding industry, rivers of gold flowing, from a large number of rainbow weddings. It didn't happen. People were talking about a billion dollar industry of same-sex marriages. It simply didn't happen. Let me give you the data on this. The first year after the Act passed through Parliament, um, the first year when you could marry as a same-sex couple was 2018. There were 6,538 same-sex marriages in Australia in 2018. Now, what is that as a proportion of all same-sex couples eligible to marry. The 2016 census, there was just under 46,800 same-sex couples living together in Australia. Now, of those 46,800, 3,142 had actually been married overseas, so they couldn't marry again. Their marriage was validated in Australian law by the 2017 Act. So that leaves around 43,500 same-sex couples who were eligible to marry in 2018. How many did so? About 15%. Only 15% of same-sex couples who were eligible to marry in 2018 actually did so. 85% did not. Now, is this just a, a, a delay? Will they catch up, as it were? Well, possibly. We don't have any data nationally for 2019 yet. Queensland data on, suggests that maybe there has been some sort of delay effect. There were 1,292 same-sex couples got married in Queensland in 2018, there were 1,100, sorry, 1,031 same-sex couples married in 2019. That's about 80% of the rate in 2018. But by the first quarter of 2020, before the pandemic shutdown affected us all, the numbers had, had flowed down to a trickle. Only 174 same-sex couples wed in Queensland in the first quarter of 2020. And that was only less than 4.5% of all the weddings in that quarter. And that's um, typical of overseas trends as well. People wanted the right to marry, but didn't necessarily want marriage it, itself. Some, some did. My good friend, Tim Wilson, who memorably um, proposed to his partner on the floor of Parliament after the vote was passed. Tim wanted to marry. It was very important to him. We had long conversations about this subject. 
But as I say, 85% in 2018 chose not to. Well, that's all I want to say on that controversial subject. I want to turn now to the impact of all of this. Is there a downside? You see, many still believe that the sexual revolution, no fault divorce, and all the other changes we've talked about are a great liberation. Marriage has been given a bad press in the progressive movement. It's associated with patriarchy, traditional division of roles between men and women. For many, the demise of heterosexual marriage, at least, is a wholly good thing. However, there are many downsides to the shift away from marriage as the foundation for family life in Australia. To put this into context, there's widespread agreement among experts that children do best in safe, stable, and nurturing families. Now, I don't need to elaborate on this, of course. Children need a safe environment. And that's not just protection from abuse and neglect, but also protection from exposure to family violence. Just witnessing or being aware of violence perpetrated against your mother can be terribly traumatizing for kids. And we need to do everything we can to help kids to feel safe. Stability, as we all know, is also very important for children. Stability of place is not nearly as important as stability of relationship. And therefore, um, predictable consistency in relationships is what matters most to kids. And the breakdown of a parent's relationship is a primary source of instability in children's lives. I hardly need to elaborate on that. If parents break up, family routines are disrupted, changes typically occur across a lot of different domains. Where children live, where they go to school, the relationship with the parent who no longer lives full time with them, levels of financial stress, and then new partners, new partners for mum, new partners for dad. It's a whole raft of changes which unsettle children's lives. And all the research shows that parental separation is an important factor to address in terms of the life chances of children. It really does affect children, not all, not equally seriously, but across the society it does have significant effects. So safety is vital, so stability is really important, and of course nurturing. Children need a nurturing family. Research indicates that children do best with a parental status authoritative. And what that means is that it is neither authoritarian nor permissive. It combines boundary setting with emotional closeness. But the tragedy of the erosion of marriage that we've talked about, that it has meant that far fewer children than a generation ago grow up in safe, stable, and nurturing families. Let me take stability first. If I can move to the next slide, please. I want to show you some data from a study of more than 12 and a half thousand people. One of the things they were asked was about their family histories. And out of that data set, the researchers who are um, presented here, uh, David DeVoe and Matthew Gray, were able to look at the separation experiences of cohorts of babies, of well, children who were born um, from World War II onwards. And if you look at the top of that graph there, you'll see that the children born between 1946 and 1955, at the age of 50, 15 years old, 8.9% and 9% have experienced their parents living separately and apart. And apart. 2.36% were born into sole parent families, single mother families, and the others, uh, their parents separated sometime between the time of their birth and the time they reached the age of 15. And you'll see in the subsequent cohorts, the 50, 1956 to 62 and so on and so forth, how those numbers rise. They rise for those who experience parental separation, they rise for those who experience um, being born into a single mother family. And when we look at the bottom row there, those who were born between 1981 and 1985, nearly 25% had experienced their parents living apart by the time they were 15 years old. Well, 1981 to 85, those are people now in their mid 30s to 40. What's the figure now? Well, the latest data we have is from 2015. And what it shows is that 40% of all children in Australia who experience their parents living apart by the time they are 17 years old, 40%, up from 25% of those who were born between 1981 and 1985. In 
other words, in less than 20 years, there's been a 60% increase in the number of children who would experience their parents living separately and apart by the time they reach the age of 17. A 60% increase in less than two decades. How is this so? Well, you may say, divorce. Divorce is the problem. Well, actually, it's not. It's not. Divorce rates have declined over the last 20 or 30 years. To give you some figures, in 1998, there were 2.7 divorces per 1,000 people in Australia. In 2018, there were two divorces per 1,000 people in Australia, so it's declined significantly. Well, that may sound like good news. It's not really, because we're talking about per 1,000 population. And because so many fewer people marry, so therefore fewer people divorce, if you have a decline in marriage rates, then 10 years later to 15 years later, you have a decline in divorce rates per 1,000 people as well. Nonetheless, the general view amongst experts is that the divorce rates are at the very least stable across uh, two or three decades. That's good news. So why has there been a 60% increase in less than two decades, the number of children who experience their parents living apart by the age of 17? There are two reasons why. The first one is this, that the numbers of children born into single mother households has doubled in less than two decades. The data we have is, the most recent data we have is from 2005. We've got no data since then. But in 2005, 13% of all babies born in Australia were born to homes without a father in the home, born into single mother households. 13%, that's more than one in eight. Now, that doesn't mean that the mother and father were no longer in a relationship. The father may have been on the scene, as it were, still in a relationship with the mother, just not living with, 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 with her. But if you look at the trajectory of those re relationships, they tend not to, to last. So 13% of all babies born in Australia, at least that, possibly more now, are born to single mother households. But the other major explanation for this exponential increase, the numbers of children who are experiencing their parents living apart at the age of 17, is because de facto relationships are so unstable. And the evidence for this is all over the world, or at least all over the Western world, where such research has taken place. Australian research shows that the odds of a de facto couple with children breaking up is more than seven times as high as those who had lived together, uh, so who had not lived together before marriage first. The odds of a de facto couple with children breaking up is seven times as high as those who had not lived together before marriage. Now you may say, well, hold on a minute. That's no surprise. Remember that 81% of people live together before marriage. So we're talking about 19% of the population these days who don't live together before marriage. And we're a quirky lot. We're the religious lot. We're the ones who have conservative values. And so no wonder there's a difference, you may say. But here's the more revealing statistic. Of those who lived together with children but did not marry, the rates of breakup were four times as high as those who began living together but went on to marry subsequently. You see, what I'm saying and what the data is saying is that marriage matters. Marriage is a profoundly stabilizing influence on relationships. And this is consistent with the overseas evidence. I could quote you any number of studies, but just two very large and very robust studies. There's the data from the fragile family studies. In the United States, it was a study of um, families in 20 cities in um, low socioeconomic groups. And what they found was that parental separation by the time the child was three was five times greater for children born to cohabiting than married parents. Five times greater. Now, there may be reasons for that. Differences in financial well-being, differences in family characteristics, differences in education differences in ethnicity, all those sorts of things, yes. But good researchers will control for those variables. We call them confounding variables, and there are ways statistically of controlling for those sorts of factors. 
And after controlling for all those covariates, they found that the odds of breaking up were still two and a half times as great if they lived together compared to if they were married when they had children. Two and a half times as great a rate of separation before the child had turned three. And very similar findings from a massive study in the UK. Again, 2.25 times more likely to break up if they were not married after controlling for all the variables by the child's fifth birthday. There's been a recent study of the um, more data analysis of that fragile family study. It's a long-term study, which shows that children born to unmarried urban parents overwhelmingly experience family structure transitions at the age of nine, approximately one half experiencing two or more transitions, and approximately one quarter experiencing three or more transitions by that time. The point is this, children born to unmarried parents are born into relationships with a very high likelihood of instability, a very high likelihood of breaking up. So those are the two reasons why we've seen this 60% increase in less than two decades in the number of children who experience their parents living apart at the age of 15 to 17 years old. And this has significant impacts on the mental health of children and young people. There's a lot of evidence for this. They're not observable in every study, but there's some compelling evidence that adolescent mental health problems have been increasing significantly over time. Teenagers have always suffered from depression, other forms of psychological distress, illnesses such as, such, such as anorexia, but just not in the numbers we are seeing now. Why? Of course, there are many reasons, and I would defer to the mental health experts to map all the different reasons why we're seeing such an increase, but we are. But one of them, one of them is family breakdown. It does seem to be a significant contributing factor. Let me show you some of the evidence. One important study was published in 2010. It's an American study. And it was the most comprehensive analysis ever done of data collected through the widely used Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory test. Now we're getting technical. But this test is the major test for various forms of mental illness. <clears throat> and although it did go through a, one significant change over its long life, it's been relatively consistent between the 1930s and the, the present time. So they analyzed data going back to 1938 of college students and what rates of mental illness they found using this standardized test in college students over the decades. And what they found was that each generation had experienced poorer mental health than the previous one. At least five times as many college students in 2007 as in 1938 had measures indicating psychopathology on the various elements in that test. On many of these measures by 2007, the increases were dramatic. And the point I want to make is this, that those increases, those massive increases in rates of serious mental illness were positively and significantly correlated with the increases in the divorce rate on all the clinical scales. Let me give you the data from Australia, quite recent data. The second Australian Child and Adolescent Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing published in 2015, an excellent study. Um, <clears throat> interviews, surveys of parents and over 6,000 households and separately data from nearly 3,000 young people aged, aged 11 to 17. 20% of adolescents in this study had high or very high levels of psychological distress. Figures were almost twice as high for females as for males. 25.9% of females, 14.8% for males. And that's a continuing theme through a lot of this literature, the trouble our teenage girls are in, in terms of mental health and well-being. More than one in 10 of the 12 to 17 year olds had self-harmed at some time in their young lives. Self-harm was roughly twice as high for females as for males. Females aged 16 to 17 years old, 16 to 17 year old girls had the highest rates of self-harm. Nearly 17% of all 16 to 17 year old girls had harmed themselves in the previous 12 months. And of course, those figures are reflected in proportion of considered suicide. Now, in terms of formal diagnosis of mental illness, the figures are different, unfortunately lower. 
14% of children and young people aged 4 to 17, according to the parents' reports, had had a diagnosed mental disorder in the previous 12 months, with especially high rates amongst male children in that study. But what I want to take you to is in the next slide is the correlation with family structure. This is data on those who had a diagnosed mental disorder between the ages of four and 17 years old in the last 12 months. And you'll see that if the original family was intact, if they were still living with their biological mother and father, the rate was 10.4% high. But if they were in step family, it was 18.3%. If they were in a blended family, it was 20.2%. To explain the difference between a step family and a blended family, a step family is where um, a new partner is not a biological parent of the children in the family. They are stepfather, stepmother. A blended family is where you have a mixture of children of the man and the woman and children which they've had together. So it's blended from children from, from another relationship together with children of their own relationship. That's a blended family slightly higher rates of diagnosed mental disorders in a blended family. If they were in a sole parent family, 22.4%. Other family, very unusual, grandparents, this, that kind of thing, 23.7%. So you can see that there is a very much higher rate of mental illness, diagnosed mental disorders, in families other than those where the children are living with their biological mother and father. Now, social scientists will tell you, and it's important, correlation is not core, core, causation. We have to be careful about how we interpret all of this. Interpretation is everything with this sort of data. And I'm not trying to simplify anything in this. But there is a lot of evidence that family stability does play an incredibly important part in all of this. To quote a leading American expert, Professor Paul Amato, one of the world's leaders in this field, he's written this, research clearly demonstrates that children growing up with two continuously married parents are less likely than other children to experience a wide range of cognitive, emotional, and social problems, not only during childhood, but in adulthood. It's not possible to demonstrate that family structure is the cause of these differences, but studies that have used a variety of sophisticated statistical methods suggest that this is the case. And there's all sorts of reasons for this. Um, conflict is a major reason why children suffer. And it used to be said it was better to separate than to live in a family with high conflict. That view is no longer so widely held for all sorts of reasons. But one of them is this, conflict doesn't end on separation necessarily. Conflict and violence can be exacerbated by separation. You see it as a family lawyer quite frequently. There's low levels of conflict which cause them to apart, to, to separate. But after the separation, all sorts of other issues come in, arguments about the parenting arrangements, arguments about the property, arguments about child support, arguments about discipline, diet, bedtimes in each home, new partners, they can be a real source of discord between former partners. They can lead to feelings of resentment, jealousy. Parents' lives move in different directions. They can have arguments about wanting to relocate within Australia or overseas. There's all sorts of conflicts that children will experience after their parents separate. And it's conflict which is most harmful to children. They're not spared from that just because the parents separate. There's also a lot of evidence which I'll present it in the written paper, you, you'll see it there, that there's greater conflict in single parent families and step families. It's not easy to be a step family. So turning quickly to children's safety, let me um, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, just give you some data on this. Family stability has important effects in relation to children's safety. Children, and especially girls, are at much greater risk of sexual abuse from the presence of men living in the household who are not biologically related to them than from their own fathers. One of the best studies on this was in 1983 by Diana Russell. It was published in 1983. And she interviewed 930 women in San Francisco in depth about their sexual histories. And part of that um, data collection, part of those interviews was about their experiences as children. There were horrifying rates of child sexual abuse that they experienced. One in 40 girls, one in 40 of these women were abused by their father, one in 40. But of those who had lived 
with a man who is not their father, those who've lived with a stepfather at some stage in their childhood, one in six were abused by the stepfather. And that data has been replicated in many other studies. It's true of child homicide too. The risk of children being murdered in their home is much greater from a step parent than a parent. Being a biological father is actually very protective of children. And there's a much higher likelihood of child protection services being involved if the parents are not living together in an intact family. The data on this, again, is everywhere. So what are the ramifications of all of this? We turn to the next slide, please. They are many. It's not just the issues of mental health of children and young people, important as that is. The instability of family relationships affects us all. The inability of so many to form and maintain stable relationships is likely to lead to a much greater level of loneliness as people age. This is a problem particularly for those who've left the workforce, because the work provides at least some degree of community which is lost, or at least significantly diminished, once working life ends. Relationship breakdown has effects on people's finances. It could have devastating impacts upon people's wealth and their capacity to care for themselves in retirement, and particularly for women who do not repartner. For women who do repartner, they can often get back to where they were before, but the statistical reality is that the likelihood of repartnering diminishes as women age. And that leaves them particularly vulnerable in old age. The ramifications of all of this even affect people's sex lives. Sexual revolution was meant to lead to a much freer attitude to sex, wasn't it? More availability of sex with more partners. The old joke was that the only people who are not having sex are married people. The little picture, though, is much more complex. I know this is not rocket science, but a satisfying sexual relationship involves a partner, it involves a continuing partner. Sex in the city may have presented one view of the world of endless sex on, on offer, but it's probably not what most people experience. And the evidence from many countries now is that people are just having far less sex than they used to. People are talking about it now as the sex drought. Another ramification is fertility rates. As it's become so much harder for people to maintain stable relationships, so the numbers of children being born has declined significantly, so that the fertility rate is now way below replacement rate in the population. That too has all sorts of effects. So the ramifications of this are huge throughout the society. Well, what about the churches? I wish I could say that these trends in Western society are merely secular trends, that the churches are unaffected by them. We all know that isn't true. It's not true of my life. It's not true of my present wife's life. Both of us have experienced marriage breakdown. We would say that for neither of our cases was this our own choice. But we've experienced it. We've experienced all the difficulties of the two becoming one, two um, families becoming one, the joys and struggles of being a step-parent. Um, that's a discussion for another day. We could write the long and difficult history of how we struggled as a step-family as um, in the first three years or so. It's true for me. Evidence from the United States suggests that the rates of marriage breakdown are not much lower in the Christian community than in those who do not profess the faith. Actually, a much more recent study than that well-known study from 2007 shows that where a couple are devoutly committed to their faith, when they pray together, marital satisfaction is very much higher and divorce rates are very much lower. And I will return to this in lecture three on Thursday night. If you can't come on tomorrow night, at least try to listen in on Thursday night if you could, because we'll be picking up a lot of these themes on Thursday. The point is we cannot be at all common complacent. What happens in secular society affects the church as well. And we have to make a real effort in the churches to promote safe, stable, and nurturing families. So by way of summary, what's happened is we are living in a society which has completely abandoned, or almost completely abandoned, Christian teaching on marriage. None of the elements which I described to you in Sir James Wilde's definition of common law in 1866 now survive. They've all been eroded over the last 45 years with profound effects on Australian society and very similar um, patterns in other countries as well. 
And while there are those who present this as a great liberation, the reality is we've sown the wind and we are now reaping the world. Notwithstanding all the other problems that are important and which attract attention, climate change, racial injustice, the problem of family instability is, in my view at least, one of the greatest challenges of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parkinson. We now move to a time of questions. So I redirect your attention to this screen over here um, and to the Slido site and the instructions are provided by email. Again, if you'd like to write a question on that slip of paper, please just put that up and people will come around and, and collect those. Um, but our lecturer is now open to taking questions and they are appearing here on the screen in front of me. I will read the question and direct it to Professor Parkinson. First question is as follows. Your talk focused on the need for a safe environment for children to be raised in. An Australian review, Dempsey 2013, concluded that children of same-sex parented families do as well emotionally, socially and educationally as those in opposite sex partner families. What are your thoughts on this? Well, thank you for the question. It's funny how quickly discussion of family life turns to same-sex relationships, isn't it? Just to put it into perspective, though, of all couples in Australia, less than 1% are same-sex couples. It's actually 0.9% according to the last census in 2016. That's an increase. Um, if you go back 10, 15 years, you'll find figures were around 0.6% of all couples are in same-sex relationships. The growth has been mainly amongst young people. So 99.1% of all couples in Australia are not same-sex couples. They're heterosexual relationships. And of course, a great many same-sex couples don't have children. It's very hard for gay men to be able to raise children. There's only really surrogacy, fostering and adoption as possibilities to um, have children as gay men. So it tends to be lesbian couples who will have children. And yes, they do well. Um, it's not just MC study, there's a whole variety of uh, studies all around the, the world. They're relatively small studies, but they are consistent studies which show that um, they do as well as children in heterosexual re relationships. Remember that we're, we're talking across the, the board, and that includes single-parent households, blended families, step families, and so on. So it's not a comparison of um, intact um, same-sex couples with only intact um, heterosexual couples. Be that as it may, the evidence is fairly consistent. And we should welcome that. We should welcome the fact that children um, in those relationships do seem to be doing well. They are much loved, uh, they are much cared for. And I know, um, you know myself, uh, families in that situation. Good. Thank you. Is there any study that ex examines the impact of divorce and parental breakdown on children and the involvement of those children in the use of legal or illegal drugs? and then any possible connection to this growing mental health issue, this, this theme of not growing mental health issues of young people that you described earlier. Thank you very much for the question. And I would, would have to plead ignorance on um, the literature specifically on the connection with drug, drug addiction. Um, but speaking more generally, what you find is a range of impacts. I've talked about the mental health impacts, but. There's also, for example, a much greater likelihood of um, teenage pregnancy if you have not grown up with two biological parents in the home. And because alcohol abuse, drug abuse flow from distress, you would expect that there would be a strong correlation between um, stressful experiences in childhood, which of course include family breakdown, and the use of um, drugs, the misuse of alcohol and drugs. Could you comment 
on the idea that the fr fragile families and the child wellbeing study oversampled unmarried mothers, therefore over representing minority and economically disadvantaged families. Well, can I say how um, well read the questions are so 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 far tonight? That's a that's a terrific um, thing to hear. Um, yes, the fragile family studies itself did actually aim to be, I did say this, a study of lower socioeconomic groups. And um, in the States, you will find that there are um, quite varying rates of marriage, depending on whether people are, are university educated or not, college educated or not. There are very, very high rates of single parent families in the black community and also quite high in the Hispanic community as well. So, um, yes, the Fragile Family Study would have oversampled and quite deliberately oversampled um, unmarried families in part of, the, of what they were wanting to study. The data, though, that I gave you is consistent across many, many studies. Um, indeed, all of them that I have seen have shown that same correlation between um, being in a de facto relationship and um, higher rates of breakdown. And that goes back to studies from the 1990s onwards. Um, and these are studies which are represented across the population as a, as a whole, like the Australian study I mentioned, where the odds of um, a couple breaking up with children if they hadn't gone on to marry was four times as high as those who did. That was an Australian study conducted at AMA. Good. Thank you. Do you have any suggestions for public policy measures to benefit marriage and family stability? <laughs> yes. Um, indeed, I <clears throat> wrote a report back in 2011, I think it was, called For Kids' Sake. Uh, it's still available on the web if you, uh, if you search, um, search for Parkinson for Kids' Sake. I made a lot of proposals um, for what we could do to promote safer, stable and nurturing families, um, none of which got any traction, such is the nature of it. I mean, we've been focused so much on other issues that we really haven't turned our attention to the problems of the 99%, the problems of family stability. So I'm going to come back to this more in the third lecture on Thursday night. Um, but I think the churches can play a really important role in this, in being um, places which can provide support in their local communities for struggling families. They can provide um, relationship education, they can provide support for people going through a divorce, they can um, give support to struggling families. And I'm going to give some examples on Thursday of uh, services which churches are running in their local communities which are doing exactly that. I see an critical role for that. There are, of course, a lot of um, other organisations which do support um, healthy re re relationships. My concern is that some of them have imbibed the spirit of the age and may not be as effective as they could be because they've taken on board a lot of the um, things we've talked about and aren't prepared to acknowledge that family structure matters or that marriage matters. It's very difficult then to have a conversation with people um, if those fundamental premises are not accepted. Good. Thank you. Given the prevalence of and acceptance of de facto relationships, let alone the legal status issues, why do people, apart from those of particular religious persuasions, bother to marry in Australia today? Well, you may well ask. And, um, my prediction is that they will do so in increasing numbers. Um, you may have heard me say that in 2017, we had the lowest marriage rate on record. It rose very, very slightly um, in 2018, but only because of those 6,500 same-sex marriages which took place in 2018. Otherwise, it would have been even lower in 2018. I expect those trends to continue. And I expect that over time, that marriage, as we have known it for the last 100, 200 years or so, will cease to be relevant to most people in Australia, except for those who have a faith. I expect that the decline will um, be more and more rapid over the next 50 years. I see nothing, in other words, which is going to turn this around unless there's a revival of faith. Thank you. Your talk focused on nuclear families. Michael Schulter of the Jubilee Centre in Cambridge says that the Bible extends the de its definition of family to include the extended family rather than just the nuclear family. 
How much should Christians think about their cousins, uncles, aunties and so on as being part of their family unit? Oh, thank you for the, for, <coughs> for the question. It's a really important point. It's not my, just Michael Schulter, whose work is wonderful on this issue and on relationships generally. Um, David Brooks uh, wrote a fascinating article in The Atlantic, I think it was, um, uh, earlier, or well, about a year, year, year ago, on the importance of the extended family. And extended family does play a critical role in supporting safe, stable, and nurturing families. So, you know, the role of the grandmother in um, helping uh, a young mum, a young, young couple out with young, young children, it, 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 it's, so, it's so important. And maybe as we grow older, we've learned to value that extended family more and more and more. Um, certainly in the pandemic, I've spent more time with my family in England than I have done uh, in the last 20 years because we've been together on Zoom. Um, not necessarily including cousins, but once or twice, yes, we, we, we have. So yes, that was a long way of saying I just absolutely endorse what Michael Schiff was saying. All families are important. We tend to have a close relationship with our family of origin, our nuclear family of origin, and our current nuclear family than we do with um, more extended families. So that, that varies an enormous amount uh, from one family to the next and from one culture to the next. Thank you. Some of, some of your slides seem to suggest that being married, compared to having a de facto union, causes you to be less likely to break up. Amongst de facto count couples, could the rate of deciding to marry correlate with the health of the relationship? Your yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, short answer is it, it undoubtedly would do. Um, so people may choose not to marry because they're just not confident um, that the relationship is the right one for them and that it's going to last. And so they stay in this in-between world of um, not being married but not separating either. And that's not a problem in a social sense um, if there are no kids. It, it is a problem though, isn't it? If they've got children born of that relationship but it's not stable and it's not um, that commitment isn't there to the, the same extent. So, yeah, un undoubtedly that's the case. And if you look at data on marital satisfaction, um, some very interesting data from Institute of Family Studies that comes to, to her mind, that married couples were much more satisfied overall with their relationship than de facto couples. Well, let's say much, much, much more, but really one sort of um, um, percentile higher, as it were, um, in that in that study. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's that that that's a, that's that's a part of it. My concern really about instability of de facto relationships is about when they are caring for children, because the focus of my life for the last 35 years has been on the well-being of children. Thank you for frankly stating some of the negative statistics about children of divorce. As a reluctantly divorced father of six, I'd be interested in any recommendations you may have on credible sources of how, for how parents can do their best in that situation. Thank you. Look, there are <clears throat> so many sources. Um, I'm sorry about your situation. Um, you may have come across the family relationship centres, which do provide support to people through relationship breakdown. And I was very involved personally in getting those centres established um, some 15 years ago. The key thing for parents who are separated is to try by any means possible to avoid conflict that the children become aware of. It's the conflict which is so damaging for kids. And if there's a way to protect them from that conflict, yes, there may be arguments, but to have them out, out of the earshot of um, the children, not talk to children about the conflict, so you keep them protected, keep them in a bubble away from that conflict. That's the best thing you can do for um, your kids if you are separated. And the other thing to, to, to say is that absent violence, abuse, um, or very high conflict, children will do the best if they have both mothers and fathers in their lives. And again, research on this is overwhelming. And I'm not talking about fathers just as visitors. I'm talking about fathers who are actively involved in that authoritative parenting of boundary setting 
and emotional closeness. They don't just um, sit on the couch with the kids watching the footy on a Saturday, they engage with their lives, they know who their friends are, they know all about um, what's happening for their children, and the children feel free to talk to them. It's that closeness that is protective of children in a separated situation. So do everything you can to avoid conflict, even at the cost of your own rights, and tr try to remain involved and keep the other parent involved in the life of the children. Those are the two golden rules. Thank you. You've, you've focused on the effects of lack of family stability on vulnerable children. Do you think there are similar effects on the vulnerable elderly population? Is this likely to be a growing problem in an ageing society? Again, thank you for a wonderful question. Um, yes, the impacts are considerable. And let me try to unpack them a little bit for you. Um, elderly parents will depend to a very significant extent on their children, at least that is very commonly the case. The older they get, the more um, they need levels of support. And if their daughter has gone through a divorce, for example, um, in her mid-30s, late 30s, 40s, when the parents are getting older, she's just got so much less capacity to be able to support her parents. She's looking after her kids. She's trying to um, cope with the financial costs of relationship breakdown. She may have been in a part-time job is trying to go back to a full-time job. She's looking at trying to repartner very often. And so she's thinking about um, her future relational life with, with somebody else. There's all these pressures, all these demands, all these things which will take her away from her capacity to look after her elderly parents. But worse, it does tend to be women who do the caring. And so if it's her former husband's elderly parents, if they'd remained intact as a couple, she would have been, in all probability, doing a lot of the caring for his parents as, uh, as, as well. But that, that obligation is likely to cease, isn't it, once the relationship is broken up. So that's just beginning to unpack um, some of the impacts for vulnerable elderly people um, but the other thing is, of course, as I explained, it's just so much less money um, available and that can affect um, the capacity to provide for services for your elderly parents as well because divorce creates a financial train wreck for, for, for people. You've had one house, you now go into two households. You've got two lots of rent, two mortgages, two fridges, two cars, two, two sofas, two Xboxes, you know. The income remains the same, but the needs can almost double. So those are some of the reasons why the ramifications of family stability affect everybody, including the elderly. Thank you. We've been peppering our lecturer with questions for up about 20 minutes now, so I'm going to finish with two, if you don't mind. Do you, do you believe that contraception has played a, a a role in the breakdown of the nuclear family or the change of emphasis in what marriage is and, and, and what point it serves? I doubt it. <laughs> Let me say I'm not a Catholic um, and concerns like contraception are particularly um, held in our brothers and sisters who are Catholics. Um, contraception plays a very big role in the sexual revolution, of course, from the 1960s onwards. It has also greatly undermined the um, exclusivity of the sexual partnership because far more people have had multiple sexual relationships uh, before they marry, and therefore that partnership, that two becoming one flesh, is not nearly as special as it would have been for those who have not had a partner before. So in that sense, yes, contraception has played a really critical role, hasn't it, in the sexual revolution and the availability of multiple partners. I suppose it's also played some sort of role also in extramarital relationships. If you don't have a serious fear of getting pregnant, then it may be much safer to have a relationship with a married man and for a married man to have a relationship with you than if contraception were not available. I think those are the connecting points, but I would, wouldn't want to draw a bigger story out of this 
than that in terms of family stability. Thank you. This is a rather provocative question to finish on, but I will put it nonetheless. Russell showed girls that didn't have both natural parents living with them was eight times more likely to be sexually abused. All abuse type risks were increased by 35 times. Can you say that not living with both natural parents is the cause of child abuse? No, no, I absolutely can't. I mean, um, it's no surprise. Uh, I don't, did not remember that data from Russell's study, but it's no surprise that where there's not two biological parents, the rates of abuse are very much higher. Just does it cause it? No. Um, but there's something very protective about being a father, isn't there? Very protective of your own children. And there's not that same bond necessarily if you're a stepfather or indeed an uncle or a grandfather. And that's where the, what, what the research shows is that men who do not have a biological connection are not biologically the parents of a child um, are just much more likely to abuse girls in particular than their own fathers. And of course that translates into extra familial relationships as, as well. A lot of abuse is by non-family -fam members. So all that data is pretty, con pretty consistent across a very large number of studies. Thank you, Professor Parkinson. I'd now like to call on Professor David Cohen, President of the UNSW Academic Board, to deliver a vote of thanks. Thanks, David. Well, it's good the uh, technology has worked well tonight. Um, it was uh, an easy presentation to be able to watch, and you're quite correct about Sydney being a dangerous place. Um, there's very, been very little progress in Sydney since the day, days of the um, Rum Corps. Uh, Australia is universally recognised as one of the more successful experiments in multiculturalism. It's certainly reflected in the UNSW community and we revel in the um, multiculturalism that we have on this campus. Uh, but the diversity extends beyond just ethnicity. Uh, it spans religion, sport, sexual orientation, politics, which is another form of sport, um, and many other dimensions. Uh, but in reveling in multiculturalism, the question has arisen as to the extent of diversity that can exist under either a single legal system at federal or state level, or even to maintain a coherent culture. So tonight we've been challenged by uh, Professor Parkinson to consider the definitions of marriage, and particularly from the perspective of the Bible and the models of family that are presented there. So um, if, as Professor Parkinson has argued, that the Christian model of marriage and family was countercultural, then it certainly appears still to be so, and may over time become even more countercultural. We've been masterfully led through the history of marriage, the evolution of the law, some consequences of changing social norms and behaviour, but most importantly, as a scientist or engineer would appreciate, you've given us some data. And we've been asked to reflect on that data and the implications of it. So on behalf of the New College lecture, uh, lecture trustees, New College itself, and the University of New South Wales, I thank you very much for a very challenging talk tonight. And first, I would invite you all to join us again tomorrow night for the second lecture in this series, which is on religious freedom. And second, if you'll join me in applauding the first lecture by Professor Parkinson. Thank you, David. And at this point, I think we're going to say good night to Professor Parkinson and let him go about the rest of his evening. We'll see him tomorrow night.
Thank you. Uh, returning to us who are here present, uh, look, thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, refreshments will be sh served shortly to those who are present here in college. Sadly, we're not able to provide the same service to those that have joined us via live stream. Um, may I in welcome you to remain with us? College stays up late, as long as you like. Uh, <laughs> uh, certainly feel welcome to um, have a look at our bookstall, have a look at our college journal called Case Quarterly. Um, which we publish. We uh, endeavour to make these issues accessible for university undergraduate students. We've been actively participating in the University of New South Wales Grand Challenges um, that have been existed over the last few years. And I think to good effect, our latest edition of Case Quarterly features a particularly handsome chicken called Jeffrey. Um, so you might want to have a look at uh, the issues that are raised there. And of course, we have special prices on subscription available this evening. So thank you for being with us. Um, if you'd like, the lectures are free. If you'd like to contribute uh, to the cost of the lectures, there's a donations um, box up the back. But please uh, feel welcome to uh, join us tomorrow night as we continue this journey. And as David's already said, consider the erosion of freedom. But for now, it's good night and the finish of our formal part of the evening. Please continue to enjoy. Um, refreshments. If I could ask you though just to try and maintain social distancing, if, if you want to speak with people perhaps if you'd sit down while you're chatting with them and that sort of thing, um, we don't want to breach any of the government rules with regard to uh, social distancing and that sort of thing. So thank you for being with us and have a good evening.